Feats of strength come in all different shapes and sizes. Whether that be a firefighter picking rubble off of a child and miraculously saving their life, or the world's strongest man picking up 500 kilograms from off of the ground and becoming the main thing dudes say hell yeah about for the next year. But it could also be as simple as just placing an egg in between your forearm and bicep, and then flexing so hard that it simply explodes, and then screaming, I'm built different! And it's as simple as that. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. The most built different people in the history books. Our first journey brings us to Scotland, the land of serene views, mythological creatures, haggis, and the world's most unknown strongest man, Angus McCaskill. Born in Scotland in 1825, Angus was one of 13 children that passed through his mother's canal, and one of the lucky ones that actually survived the passage of birth in the 1800s. Although he was born in Scotland, he didn't end up spending much time there. His family moved to Cape Breton, Nova Scotia by the time he was six. At this point, there wasn't anything remarkable about this boy. Being fathered by a man who was five foot nine and a mother even shorter, his days of looks maxing and mogging were certainly questioned early on. But the saying grows like a weed goes around for a reason. Remarkably, by the time adolescence rolled around, Angus sprouted into a seven foot four absolute structure of a man. A couple more years went by, when he then finally topped out at seven foot nine inches tall. There are different reports on his weight, but somewhere around 500 pounds seems reasonable. And I know what you're thinking, uh, who cares? He's not even the tallest person ever. But anyone that was actually taller than him had a glandular deformity or gigantism. Angus was quite literally the tallest non-pathological giant to ever exist. And he still is. There was much more to him than his height. The rest of him was large too. <laughs> he had a chest that reached over 80 inches, shoulders that grew up to 44 inches, and palms the size of two palms. Imagine if this dude had a modern day bodybuilding coach and access to steroids. I'm kind of foaming at the mouth just thinking about it, like full-blown rabies style. What really makes Angus stand out in his short-lived, long-legged life is the absolute mind-shattering feats of strength he apparently accomplished. These range from holding a 100-pound dumbbell with two fingers at arm's length for 10 minutes, carrying not one but two 350-pound casks total, and there's also reports of him picking up a full-grown horse and putting it on the other side of a four-foot-tall fence. What? But the most impressive and unrealistic feat of strength is by far the Anchor Incident. The Anchor Incident may have taken place in New York, or New Orleans, or a dream realm where Scottish people go at nighttime and pretend to be better than they actually are. Regardless of all that, Angus was simply working away as he normally did when he was approached by subhuman French sailors. These sailors, being the French people that they were, were not nice people, taunting Angus, saying he's not even 8 feet tall, mocking him. They said he couldn't even lift an anchor that was 2,700 pounds. You fucking kidding me, lads? Yelled Angus at the top of his lungs as he hopped off his ship and into the wharf. He threw the anchor over his shoulder with ease and simply walked down the wharf with it. The French sailors were simply in shock at this point, and all Angus could do was dance a little jig in front of them. Sadly, while doing the hoe down, one of the flukes of the anchor would end up catching Angus on the shoulder, crippling him in his anchor lifting career. Angus went on to live a long life of 38 years which in the 1800s at 7 feet and 9 inches tall, I mean, I assume with the circumstances that he was given, that's a pretty long time. The next story on the list takes place in 19th century China and involves a shipload of pirates. Get it? Yeah, you do. I have to start this off by saying that while researching this, I realized that the pirate life is absolute dog shit. It's nothing like the movies Johnny Depp starred in. And there's no octopus people. Being a pirate kind of just sucked. You're basically just a group of homeless people on a boat with a bunch of medieval rules you have to follow or else you get your ears cut off and have them fed to you. But I'd be a liar if I said no one was actually good at this pirate thing. Enter Ching Shi. This individual might just be the most successful pirate in human history. Ching Shi, also known as Madame Ching, was born in 1775 to humble beginnings. Not much is known about her early life, but it's possible she was a prostitute on a floating brothel who worked her way up in the ranks within said community. Anyway, fast forward 26 years to 1801 and all of a sudden she's married to a pirate. Specifically this guy, maybe, who just so happened to be a private for the Vietnamese dynasty and fought in multiple quote-unquote wars. Zheng Yi hailed from a family of pirates whose roots traced back all the way to the Ming dynasty. He also had an adopted son, and by adopted son I mean literally abducted and forced to be his kid. He also had to be a pirate. Lil Bro just had no say in the matter at all. Life's not all bad though. The kid actually turned out to be really good at his job, and he swiftly rose through the ranks. Just remember, no matter how good you are at something, there's always a 15-year-old Chinese pirate who's better at it than you. Between 1801 and 1807, a period of fighting amongst pirates occurred. Lots of pirate lore happened, and the largest pirate confederation was formed. It consisted of six fleets known by the color of their flags. Red, black, 
white, yellow, and purple. Zheng Yi commanded the largest fleet within the Confederation, the Red Flag Fleet. The entire Confederation was made up of over 70,000 men and 400 sailing vessels. In 1807, tragedy struck, and Zheng Yi died by literally falling overboard and being swept away by the sea. That means that Qing Shi was about to take over the reins. She effectively inherited her now dead husband's command over the entire pirate confederation, while her adopted son became the official commander of the Red Flag Fleet. While Qing Shi was in charge, she put a new code of conduct in place. Under these rules, pirates and her fleets would be executed if caught stealing plundered goods, and were not allowed to partake in gross pirate sex stuff with any females. She maintained good relationships with the leaders of every fleet in her command. She oversaw everything from monetary transactions to religious ceremonies. Not only was she personable, but she was also a strategic mind, and was no stranger to warfare. Her fleets regularly embarrassed the southern Chinese navies, and they quickly grew notorious for kidnapping Chinese officials, blockading rivers, and basically doing whatever they wanted. By 1809, China's government was officially pissed off, and rightfully so. They ended up borrowing well-armed vessels from the British East India Company and the Portuguese Navy. While forcing Qing Shi into submission, they also offered up amnesty to the pirates that actually wanted to surrender. Qing Shi was not your average pirate. Instead of pillaging and plundering until she would be met with Davy Jones's locker, she opted out and decided to take a different route. She took 17 pirate wives and children to the Governor General's office and worked her way into a rather good amnesty deal. Qing Shi carried on living her life until passing away in 1844 at the age of 69. Up next on the docket, we'll head back to one of the hardest challenges humanity has ever faced, World War II. But more specifically, we'll be looking at the Winter War. Here's some of the shortest backstory you'll ever hear since this video isn't actually about events but rather specific people. This was a war between the Soviet Union and Finland. It began three months after the beginning of World War II. The battle lasted only three months, but within that time, thousands of casualties were laid to rest on both sides, as it usually is with war. At the end of that three months, Finland was considered victorious, and the Moscow Peace Treaty was signed. Finland had to surrender 9% of their territory to the Soviet Union, but their gains heavily outweighed their losses. The Soviets suffered heavy losses during these months, over 300,000 casualties. Of course this was a joint effort from Finland, but there's one man who stands out among them. That man was Simo Heihe, aka the White Death which is the fucking sickest, most non-racist nickname I've ever heard. So let's talk about the man who's been labeled as the most deadliest sniper in history. Sima was born on the 17th of December, 1905. He was raised in the old Finnish region of Karelia. As he grew, he became a farmer by profession, and a man with several gun-related hobbies, which included hunting, shooting, and IRL counter-strike. As we learned earlier, the war broke out during the prime of Simo's life. So at the age of 33, he had to leave the sheeps for a few months and deal with more important matters. For the next 98 days, he'd go on a reign of terror that the Soviets were unprepared for. Simo was never seen or heard, but still went on killstreaks capable of getting a nuke. He once took down 25 men in a single day. Simo's reputation grew rapidly, and when the Russians found out about the sniper, the nickname The White Death was born. At one point, Simo had killed an enemy sniper with one bullet. This upset the Russians, who immediately dropped a mortar strike near his position. But by the grace of God, the legend himself came out of the situation unbothered, without a single scratch on his person. Simo's lifelong experience of hunting birds and other animals granted him a gigantic benefit on the battlefield, as he developed many tactics to keep hidden, and was capable of estimating the distances of his enemies better than anyone else. As a hunter, you need sharp vision and the ability to recognize targets, and also how they react. Any game will try to escape after the first shot and defend itself until its last breath, and the harsh reality is that the same thing goes for humans on the battlefield. Through the 98 days he fought, he secured over 500 confirmed kills. He was trained in guerrilla warfare, and was the top sniper in the entire Finnish armed forces. You are nothing to him but just another target. He will wipe you out with precision the likes of which has never been seen before on this earth. Mark his words. You think you can get away with saying that stuff to him over the internet? Think again, fucker. As you speak, he is contacting his secret network of spies across the USA, and her IP is being traced right now. So you better prepare for the storm, maggot. The storm that wipes out your pathetic little thing you call your life. You're dead, kiddo. He can be anywhere, anytime, and he can kill you in over 700 ways. And that's just with his bare hands. Not only is he extensively trained in unarmed combat, but... <sighs> what just happened? The last week of the war, Simo was finally hit. An explosive bullet managed to strike his jaw, putting him into a coma for one week. This caused facial scarring and pain for years and years. But after all of that, the war was over and Simo happily returned to his farm. He stuck to himself for the remaining years of his life, just him and the sheep. In a mere 98 days, he went down in the history books as a legend. 
The last person on the list is perhaps the most built different person to ever grace the gaming scene. SK Telecom T1 Faker. This man is an absolute specimen on the keyboard and mouse. With over 1200 APM in a game as simple as League of Legends, four Super Bowl rings on each of his index fingers, what else is there to say? That's the GOAT. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and think about subscribing. Until next time.